Good evening. And I am extremely excited and delighted. And as I sort of delay waiting for my slides to come up, <laughs> we'll sort of say a strong appreciation for you guys coming here. Uh, I, I was totally floored, totally like honored. This is one of those things where you don't think you're going to get at all, and then all of a sudden you do. So it's not like the Oscars where you have a good move and you go, well, I think this movie is Oscar worthy. You don't know anything. And the next thing you know, someone says, hey, you've been nominated. And I was sort of like, for what? And they were like, last lecture. And so my first thought with that was, I need to sort of do a bit disclosure here. So what's my first disclosure? If you know the last lecture series, it really sort of blew up when one of the guys that gave the last lecture found out this was indeed his last lecture. This is not my last lecture. And so I'm hoping I will see you guys next week, next month. Yeah. But he wasn't the only one to do a last lecture. If you actually think about people like Martin Luther King, he also had a last lecture. Now, that's a different disclosure. Hopefully, some of you do not think this is my last lecture <laughs> and that some of you won't take me out. But in addition to that, I always turn to whenever I want my own inspiration or my own sort of excitement, I turn to... Basically, I turned to Morgan Freeman. The guy's been God. He's been Nelson Mandela. He's been president of the US like twice in movies. And so if you think about the uh, Shackleton, not the Shackleton, think about the actual you know, Shawshank Redemption movie, that was also Andy Dufresne's last lecture. Full disclosure, I'm not tunneling through a wall. I'm not escaping to Zewataneo. So that's not what we're going to do. But I was still left with this idea of what do I say for my last lecture? And so like most people, if you don't know this about me, uh, my research interest is I study institutions. How do practices become routinized over time? So what's the first place you would do if you wanted to know something about the last lecture? You would look up the last two people that did the last lecture. <coughs> this would not be like that. I don't think I'm that funny. I don't think I'm that inspiring. So you students in the class, this will feel like a bit of a regression to the mean in terms of your expectation. But I thought, what do I actually say? Because it's also my last lecture. So what's the me part of this? And people that sort of know me, people know different pieces of me, I sort of have this three-part narrative. Part one, I joke in terms of my day job, research professor. And up front, up top, are sort of my first two graduate students. And to graduate students out there, I did not break them. They actually have jobs in academia. They're getting tenure. So I think I did a good job there. But I also have this other job, and that's sort of the work I do with executives. And that may have been the first or second time I went to Botswana with Stephen Hacker, and I'll say more about him, so do I talk about that? But there's also this third part of me. And people that know me, when you can't find me in a suit and tie, you're going to find me in shorts and basketball shoes on a basketball court. And probably the job I enjoy the most is really somewhere between coaching a bunch of kids just having total fun running around the court, or coaching really elite level athletes, many of which were the same athletes. So as I started thinking about what am I actually gonna say here, I really narrowed down to my time in Botswana. And you gotta know a bit about me to get my quirkiness, and then we'll actually get what I'm talking about. But in a sense, I used to spend a lot of time in Botswana. And Botswana, you know, I'm jet lagged, it's about 12 hours away, and then what I would do is, at the end of the show, I would, for the most part, I'd go home and watch TV. And there was this wonderful show on called As Time Goes By. And if you don't know the show, it's on BBC or PBS or something. And Lionel Hardcastle, he's the guy in the show, he went away to Korea. Uh, Judy Dench was his girlfriend at the time. They separate because of the war and find each other like 30, 40 years later. They find each other because Lionel wanted to write about his time in Kenya. So that was the fictional book, My Life in Kenya. And I always thought, wouldn't that be really cool if we could write our book. And we would call it Our Life in Something. And so what I want to talk to you about today is my life in Botswana, how it shaped me, how it influenced what I think in terms of research and teaching, how I think it means to be a scholar, and then the lessons I learned that may end up being lessons I think you may benefit from. So that's where we're going to go. And uh, last full disclosure, I totally forgot all measure of watch or cell phone. So if this gets long, give me the sign or something, and then we'll just stop. So I, I thought I'd start at the beginning, right? And that's the beginning to really say, I am not the fashion person, my mom is. <laughs> okay? Because she would have dressed me like that for my kindergarten picture. I really remember that story. I remember that picture because I enjoyed school. 
I had three older brothers and sisters. There were four of us in a five-year band. So I remember being the youngest, watching my older sister go to school, thinking that was so cool. She left the house, she came back with stuff. And then the next sister go to school, left the house, came back to stuff. So when it was my time, I was ready to go. Put me in the best clothes ever for the picture for school. Right? And then from there, that's my junior high picture. And so I lived in the city. We grew up in Chicago. Eventually, I moved to Maywood, which was the worst part of Chicago, if that makes sense. And my mom had four kids in a five-year span, one bathroom. And we lived in a city where most kids would have been, the women would have been pregnant before high school graduation. The guys would have been in prison or maybe drug use if graduated high school at all. She graduated four kids in this order, high school graduation, college graduation, get a job, we used to joke, then kiss a girl, <laughs> then go to work. And that was how she did it. And so a lot of my lessons about life could have been my time in basically 1820 South 10th Avenue, Maywood, Illinois. But that would be a boring for you guys, so we're going to keep moving on. Right? I graduated with my degree in engineering from Northwestern University, and I started working in Procter & Gamble. And like most engineers at PNG, you sort of have one or two paths. Either you don't cut it, so they ask you to leave after a couple of years, or you do a really good job and you eventually get increasing levels of responsibility. And I remember at one point being sort of the Zest brand operations manager. So we're consolidating all of Zest Bar Soap from multiple facilities down to about two. And I'm on the phone old days, pre-cell phone, pre-like Skype. So I'm on sort of two phones one in Mexico, because they wanted a harsher bar soap, because this is a bit of chemistry. Soap works with water. The chemistry of the water connects to the chemistry of the soap. So I have that conversation. France had a different chemistry of water, so they wanted a different chemistry of soap. The engineer in me could make it anyway. The manager in me was like, how do I make this? And that question of sort of how do we make those decisions where there really isn't a wrong answer, there are just two different right answers, really shaped me. First, it shaped me to think about where would I go to find those answers. No surprise for me, someone that loved school, I went back to school. So I ended up going back to get my MBA at the local university, and I took a class in what would effectively be like principles of management. I just fell in love with that class. I thought, wow, people get paid to talk about this stuff. I want that job. <laughs> so I quit p and I quit the MBA program, I eventually went back to Northwestern to get my PhD, but I always had this sort of practical curiosity, if you will, and that was the curiosity that led me to get the PhD, and so eventually, I find myself doing work in Botswana, and that's what we'll talk about a bit. My time in Botswana sort of connected to my time, if you will, and my PhD studies and my job, and eventually, as Lloyd mentioned, 2006, I find myself here. So I want to talk about that middle part in Botswana. First, Botswana, like most countries, they're not in this case, but they were a British protectorate. So what does that mean? They were part of the Commonwealth. Only as they would say, they volunteered to be part of the Commonwealth. They weren't colonized. And so the country, you know, the United Kingdom said, hey, England, we'll give you back. In 1966, they have independence. In 1967, they discover diamonds. So here's this new country that's, by the time I saw them, 30 years old or so, with some sense of stability, free and fair, clear election, but at the same time, some challenges. What was the challenges? HIV AIDS. And so if you sort of picture the country, it would feel a bit like Alberta minus Calgary. The capital city, one big dominant city, in this case, Haberone, and then the second largest city would be like Lloyd uh, Lethbridge, or it would be like you know, Red Deer, the second largest city, Francistown, it was about 50% HIV positive. And so me and a couple of colleagues, we show up there. That's Stephen, the guy I used to work with at Procter & Gamble. His wife, Marlon, the picture down to the left, she was my first boss at Procter & Gamble. And then we ran into somebody, Tammy, from a, another set of conversations, and we started going to Botswana. Really with this question of how do we help them navigate that vision 2016 in light of the challenges they had. And I think one of the reasons why they liked us was that we were academics. I was getting my PhD, had my PhD. Marla has her PhD in industrial engineering. But we weren't traditional academics. We weren't consultants in that sense. And as I would joke, that's because we all had a day job. 
We all wanted to get back to our lives as professors. Me, I had to get tenure. Marla, she had to get tenure, so we weren't really trying to stay over there as consultants, and I think that healthy tension is why we hung around for what was eventually 12 years. And so somewhere along the way, about four or five years in, we started thinking we're academics, we should write about this. And I eventually wrote two books. One was about change, but in order to make sense of change, organizational change, we had to get leadership right and teamwork right. And that's the one in the middle. I could spend years talking about Botswana, because I was doing the math to sort of add up how much time I spent there. And I think I spent about a year and a half in Botswana over a 12 year period. We would fly over for two weeks at a time and we did two or three trips a year for the first eight or so years. And then it trickled down to one or two trips and eventually my last time over was probably three or four years ago. Yeah. I have four stories I wanna share. The one is I remember to the day, the day I went over. Why? Because as we were landing in Habarone, capital city, we then took a bus up to Francistown four hours away. So imagine landing into Edmonton on the plane and then taking a bus out to Grand Prairie or Fort McMurray. That's the idea. We get there and the next day, a worker pilot from Air Botswana found out he was HIV positive. And he was mad at Air Botswana and so because of that, he snuck into the plane, the one plane, and eventually crashed the other three planes. And I'm in Botswana thinking, oh crap, how do I get home? Oh crap, this is really serious. Oh my God, what are people gonna think when they see on CNN that this thing happened? First, it didn't make CNN. Botswana wasn't that big of a country. Two, they eventually figured out what to do with that from their side. But it totally shaped me and what do I have to say about this? What do I have to say about what are real problems, not theorized problems, not academic problems in that sense? And that forever haunted me in terms of having these two lives, the theory side, but also the academic side. Second story, I was now in Botswana a couple years. I'm now feeling comfortable in what I have to say. And I remember we would do training for the military. So their Botswana police would be police, secret service, Botswana defense would be connected to that. So every year for about seven years, we did strategic planning for Botswana the military. And one of the things we were talking about was engagement. How do you get more people engaged, not just to salute because they have to salute? And I remember making a really big deal to the 40 people in front of me that you don't have to salute. You can imagine what they would have said, we have to salute with the military. You don't have to salute. About a week later, the folks in the Congo did not salute. And the army assassinated the president. I'm thinking next day, okay guys, you don't have to salute, you don't have to assassinate either. Like there's a space in between there of what you wanna do, right? Let me get clear. But it gets, in a sense for me, and now it gets worse, but there are two main hotels in Habarone. There's the Grand Palm and the Habarone Sun. So my room is in the Habarone Sun on the fourth floor. And the way the hotel worked, it was like 4.30 was here and then 430 to 500 would be that way on the rooms, 429 to 400 this way in the rooms. But the other hotel, the Grand Palm, was the opposite. So I'd been there so often, I would actually get out of the hotel and turn the wrong way. This time I think I'm going toward my room and I see there are a bunch of guys that look about like me, but these guys are clearly carrying machine guns. And I'm thinking, what is going on here? And then I find out that they're negotiating in order to get the son to come back from where he was to become president. So they're negotiating the peace treaty on my floor <laughs> in the hotel, to which I go down to the front desk. I look like these people. I cannot be on the same floor. They may mistake one of them for one of me. Put me on the third floor. Put me on the fifth floor. Put me someplace else in this hotel. But again, it was another one of those real experiences where you realize real work is being done here, not just sort of make work in terms of change, in terms of influence, in terms of engagement. The third story was probably the most humbling for me. At this point, I'd been in the country for a while. People knew we were starting to get some purchase. We were turning our conversation from strategic planning, designing strategies, really to change thinking. How do you then get organizations to change toward these strategies? 
So someone invited me to facilitate a workshop. It was not why I was over there. Hey, if you have a free afternoon, show up in the workshop. Where is it? It's in the hospital. What's it about? Well, HIV AIDS was starting to have such a big issue in the country that the accountants and the doctors were starting to fight because the accountants realized that the last week of a person's life is when they spend the most money. So you're an accountant, what would you think? Why are we spending that much time with them for the last week? Once they get to a certain point, just let them die. The doctors were saying, but they're people, we can't let them die. And then they turned to me, Marvin, what do you think? <laughs> what do I think? I'm not a doctor or an accountant. So again, it got me thinking, well, what would I think? What would the research say? What would the literature say? What would this mean for us in some sense? Then the last one is, and this is one where uh, I felt so fortunate, because you can imagine if you work in an organization, as soon as someone says something that's a bit uh, intense, one of the easy answers you hear is, this isn't for me, this is for my boss. Or the bosses say, this isn't for me, this is for my staff. That's a fairly easy answer. At one point, we did training for every uh, principal of high schools in the whole country. Because again, from the HIV AIDS issue, what started to happen were really just a series of events. First event, as you have more teachers sick or, get the, or die from the disease, you just started bringing more and more students in the classrooms. And at some point, the country realized we can't squeeze more kids in the same classroom. The second issue, as the parents started dying, then the kids all of a sudden had a harder time being mentored and parented with regards to education. They wouldn't come back to school. So if you think about us over here, if you have kids or if you remember when you were in high school, what would happen? The teacher, if they wanted to talk to your parent, would send you something home. Write a note in your agenda or some way communicate that way. But what would happen? The note wouldn't come back and the kid wouldn't come back. And so we started working with superintendents and principals and all the way through the organization. At one point, up to and including cabinet. But what are we going to do with this? And I remember sitting there, he's the president now, he was then vice president, and he turns to me and basically says, you're the smart one in the room with the PhD. What do you have to say about this? And that just haunted me as a professor, as a teacher, as a <coughs> scholar in some sense, that it wasn't an either or. It wasn't either you're an academic or you're a consultant either your ivory tower or your practical. My time in Botswana, people were expecting me to be both. They were saying, we trust that you are well-trained, we trust that you are insightful and knowledgeable, and what can you tell me today to solve today's problems? So my time in Botswana really shaped how I saw myself as a teacher, how I saw myself as a scholar, it shaped how I thought about the research I did. And so in a sense, what did I learn from my time in Botswana? First one is, it totally shaped my views on teaching. I would say before, I thought teaching was sort of a one-way transmission of information, but in a sense, this is way more technology than we would have. We're in Botswana, we're in Habarone. Every now and then the power would go out. If the power went out here, what would we do? We would stop, we'd go find somebody to see what's going on. The power went out there, they expect you to keep going because this is a regular occurrence so you can't stop all of a sudden and say, time out. Next time I come over, I'll have something to say. So it started changing how I teach. Specifically, firm grounding and research. My first time over in Botswana, I didn't know who I was talking to. No big deal. So I would say what I wanted to say. And then I made the mistake of checking the biographies of the people. The second time over, I used the most weasel words possible. Well, it depends on, well, I'm not quite sure. Well, you know, some people may think, well, that wasn't good either. Because now all of a sudden, why would they bring me over there if I didn't have anything I wanted to say? So then what would I basically do? I'd ask them questions. I'd go away and research the mess out of it. And then I'd come back with what I thought I thought the answer was. But the second thing it was, was it really helped me to start thinking about telling stories, especially now between Wikipedia and Google and TED Talks, and you can get the content from someplace else. So then why do you need instructors? Why do you need teachers? Because it can't be to disseminate information. 
you can get that from other people. I think it's to help you make sense of it. So I started thinking the last thing I will do is read from a textbook ever again. The last thing I may ever do is actually assign a textbook because you can go find all that stuff. Let's just sit down and tell stories. Let's just sit down and talk about the subject that we're going to talk about. The one that I'm constantly reminded of is I'm the only one with a PhD. And so I get totally excited in words. I get totally excited in really big, sophisticated concepts. And I could talk about institutional logics versus institutional practices versus legitimacy versus ice. And just like you guys are looking at me, like, what's he talking about? That reminds me. I'm the one with the PhD. My job is to actually talk in a way you can make sense, not necessarily to dumb it down. That's insulting. But not to hide behind <clears throat> these big words. And then the last one is, everything's a teachable moment. For example, my coolest inspiration, and you're going to walk away with these three minutes. This is an aside. This is a tangent. This is a free one. This is not about the last lecture at all, right? You're getting ready to walk away with the ideal view on leadership. My ideal view on leadership, Charlie Brown and the Christmas story. Because before I say the Christmas story, we know Charlie Brown's narrative. And what's Charlie Brown's narrative? Blockhead, loser, the world is terrible. And that's how he comes to the Christmas story. But he comes to the Christmas story with a totally different perspective. Something's bugging him. And because something is bugging him, that's what starts to drive this story. So what does he do when something's bugging him? He goes to a consultant. If you remember the show, he goes to Lucy. He has that can. Lucy puts, he puts a nickel in the can. Lucy hears it. Money, 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 money. And then Lucy says, you need involvement. Great insight. If something is bugging you, go toward the something that's bugging you. He gets involved. He tries to direct the play. And here's where we see bad management. He gives scripts. He gives out roles. He sets the scene. None of that stuff works. And then he finally says, I need a symbol of what I want. And if, you, and if you've ever seen this show, you can start to picture it. He thinks about that crappy little Christmas tree. That crappy little Christmas tree, the live one, not the plastic one, not the pink one. That tree really became that symbol to him of what he wanted. And then that symbol of the tree eventually ended up to putting on the play. They sing a song. Linus has the lights and talks about what it all means. And they celebrate. As a leader, he got done what he wanted to get done with people that didn't necessarily want to do it. How did he do that? He had to figure out what his tree was. So I think for us, as people who are interested in being leadership, it's not about the rules or the roles or the narrative or the directions. It might be figuring out what your tree is. That was a free one. That's not. That's just a tangent. Yeah. Okay, yeah. All right, yeah. So being in Botswana also shaped my experiences as a scholar. What I mean by that is, I think I see myself now as someone that want to connect to all communities. And by all communities, I do mean academic communities. And so I did get tenure many years ago. I became a full professor this year. So this was the coolest year of like the years as an academic. I started this year in October in Vancouver, Victoria, Toronto, and Ottawa with the new president, sort of talking to alumni. That was cool. So in the middle of the year, I found out I got a full professorship. Way cool. I ended the year with the last lecture. I don't know what's happening next year. I don't know how it's going to top this year. Right? So I communicate to those communities. But probably because of my time in Botswana, I really found the need to communicate to practical communities. In a sense, what I mean by that is follow the noise. So when I worked in Procter & Gamble, we would do about 200,000 bars of soap a day. You can imagine, take an uh, indoor football field, put four manufacturing lines across, and that's what I managed every day. It would be noisy. The worst sound in the world would be no sound. And now I come to work as a professor every day. When I'm not teaching in a classroom, I go into my office, I close the door, no sound. <laughs> it just started driving me crazy. So I started going out to find places where there were sounds. The one I find the most exciting, I work with the Business Students Association, undergraduate on campus. You want to figure out what the noise is? Go hang out with a bunch of undergrads. <laughs> because they'll tell you what the noise is every day, every issue. The issues are always current. The issues are always lively. They're always exciting. And it was just a way to keep me involved in the noise that's going on. 
But I think it's also more than that. As Lloyd said earlier, uh, my passion project, it really is basketball. But admittedly, I'm going to come at it with my PhD academic training. So no surprise, I started working with Edmonton Youth Basketball Association. Basically, my two kids, when we moved up here, they said one thing. Well, they said two things, but I won't embarrass them in public, right? But they said one thing. The one thing they said was, is there any basketball in Edmonton? So back in 2006, I did not have the answer to that. So what do you think I did? I Googled in the early days of Googling basketball in Edmonton. And I found Edmonton Youth Basketball Association. I met somebody that was a guy who works in a bookstore here on campus. And he would say, hey, come over and meet. We met. And in six months, I was president of UYBA. Why? Because they were surprised anyone wanted to be president of a basketball association. <laughs> so I was president. But it really helped me to think. You know, I read books about organization and leadership and about governance and about structure. I have this passion. The scholar in me should connect those two things. And that's sort of how it's also shaped my time. In addition to that, I really want to end with sort of these five lessons. In my mind, I have five things that I think help me that I hope as you move on will help you as you go forward. Lesson one, consciousness. Lesson one is uh, you got to get clear on what it is you want. Why? Because there is so much noise out there in the world. And it's getting worse and worse over time because the pace of the noise is faster and faster. I'm going to date people in the room right now without even asking your age. Because my parents grew up when the first time they started watching TV, it was Shogun. I remember as a kid watching Roots. Roots was this sort of show that came on Monday through Friday, three hours each. You were turning on the TV at 7 o'clock till 10, Monday. So to watch this show, you had to be committed. You had to really say, I want to watch the show. If you're my generation, the one hour show, Dallas, uh, Notch Landing. If you're a, year, a little bit younger than me, half hour, Seinfeld, uh, Friends. If you're younger than that, YouTube clips. <laughs> if you're younger than that, Seven Second Vines. Think about how that totally changes the noise that comes to you. And so as we get quicker and quicker and more noise, you got to work harder and harder to figure out what it is you want and miss the noise. There's a book, Mahai Chicksent Mahai Flow, and I'm going to summarize basically it this way. When I first came here, you know, those of you that you may not know this, this is a trick question, but I really had two questions about this town, Edmonton. Weather wasn't one of them. I'm from Chicago. I'm used to cold weather. It really was black church, black barber. Because unbeknownst to most people, you can't just even say Google black church and get a bunch of churches <laughs> or black barber and get a bunch of barbers. But as I look out, I didn't see many black people. So then I could be angry. This is a stupid town, worst town ever. I'm getting back on a plane as soon as possible. Or I could wait until I see a black person or, which is the third option, I could ask everyone I see if they know a black person. <laughs> because guess what? Everyone knows a black person. The difference is, I don't know it until I ask. And so what Mahai Chik Sint Mahai is saying is, everything you want is actually out there, just gotta ask for it. That's how I got to Botswana. Basically, I wasn't Stephen and Marla's only employee at PNG. They had hundreds of employees. How did I end up on this crazy journey with them? Because when they said, hey, are you interested in this? I said, yes. Hey, are you interested in this? I said, yes. And in the midst of yes, I would figure it out. I remember my first time over Botswana. Not only was I excited to go, just to be in Africa for the first time. They put me on business class, even cooler. <laughs> they paid me when the thing was over. I didn't think I was getting paid. So I thought they wanted me just to go to Botswana. How cool is that? That's what got me to think about something else. I have a friend of mine that says this. Uh, him and his wife, they were in their mid-60s or something like that, and they were getting ready to retire. And they were sort of talking in the back of their heads about, you know, maybe we'll retire in a cabin. Think like going to live in Jasper. We have this uh, allure of that. 
but he never did anything about it. At some point, as they're getting close to retirement, the wife says, either we're going to get a cabin to move in or we're going to stop talking about it. Well, you know what happened. They couldn't run away from seeing things like cabins. They'd be on the bus, get a paper, open up the page, and the page they opened up to was cabins for sale in the area they want. They'd be in the restaurant, and while they're in the restaurant, what would happen? They would hear over someplace else, hey, what do we do with Aunt Susie's cabin now that she died? Because what happens is, once we get clear on what we want, guess what happens? We get what it is we want. And so I think one of the lessons from us is, so what is it we really want? To do that, you got to spend a lot of time in prison. <laughs> right? All influential leaders, I didn't say all positive leaders, don't put in that Marvin thinks that you know, Hitler was a cool guy. I'm not saying that at all. But all influential leaders, many of them wrote while they were in prison. Before I get to that story, this slide was probably one of the most stressful parts of my life as a professor. Because it's really easy to talk about leadership, to talk about consciousness, and then put up Martin Luther King. That's an easy story. Who's going to argue with that one? I'm not going to get any comments from anybody else about me saying Martin Luther King was a conscious guy. Who's going to argue about Nelson Mandela? Who's going to argue about Gandhi? Who's going to argue about Aung San Suu Kyi? Her dad died, me and Mar dissonant. As her dad was died, she decided she wanted her own country. She goes on house arrest. Who's going to... Now I pull up Hitler. Oh, so are people going to say I think Hitler's a good person? Are people going to say I think I'm supporting Hitler? No, it fits the actual story. If you think that was hard, now I put up Apostle Paul. Apostle Paul wrote half of the New Testament awaiting his trial in Rome. So am I saying you guys should all be Christian? So am I saying I'm trying to proselytize people with a religious story? Or... Am I just completing the story of influential leaders that spend time in prison? For me, that harkened back to my time in Botswana. They harkened back to, in order for me to help them, I have to be clear on who I am. I have to have my own consciousness. And part of my own consciousness is Apostle Paul fits the narrative. So obviously I didn't draw that picture. Obviously we have no picture. But if there was a picture, people think that was his picture. But he fits the narrative. Now back to the narrative. They all spent time in prison. Many of them wrote while they were in prison. I already mentioned it. Notes from a Birmingham jail. Long walk to freedom. Mein Kampf. Half of the New Testament. I think part of what that means is, one, spend time in prison. I'll unpack that in a second. But also begin to write and think while you're in prison. Why do I think prison was so influential? Because prison gives us time to think. I go back to when I was in prison. Being in Francistown, no Air Botswana flights, wondering what's going to happen. But it isn't just think. The question now is, what are you thinking about? And I think the first thing we should think about is, how did I get here? Because this was Martin Luther King's. Martin Luther King's his first time wasn't actually going to prison. It happened later. The first time was the, civil, the march, the bus, the bus boycotts. And so think about what he did. Think about how neutral this was. He said, we don't like the fact that blacks can't ride the front of the bus. So what we want to think he did was he blew up buses. No, he didn't. He protested around the bus. No, he didn't. All he said was, let's just not take a bus. We'll just walk. But that was so disruptive that someone decided to bomb his house, throw him in jail, vilify him. You can imagine what he was thinking about in that moment. How does this make sense? Now let's come back to maybe you or I. We're in school, we're in our job, and things aren't going as well as we thought. What's the first question? How does this make sense? How did I get here? The second question then is, does it make sense? Do I still want to do this knowing it may lead to this? This was Nelson Mandela. He stayed in prison much longer than he had to. Why? Because he thought it made sense to stay in prison. Martin Luther King. 
Once he started going to jail, he started having speeches. We're going to prison tonight because they don't believe this. Because that made sense. I joke with Marla all the time. Because as much as I was neutral to Botswana, Marla was anti-Botswana. She had two little adopted kids at home. She really wanted to spend time with them, not be in Botswana. And I joke, how did you keep going back? Because the first time we went over there was about the worst thing that ever happened. I didn't even share with you a fifth story that happened. We went on the game ride. The car got stuck. We have no gas, no car. We're in the middle of Africa. It's getting dark. It's getting dark. Now what do we do? Well, we're still alive, so that was a good story. But at the end of the day, why would I keep going back? That's the jail thinking. How does it make sense? If it does make sense, then you come out with a quicker pace. No surprise. If it does make sense, you come out with more energy. So I do think part of the consciousness building for all of us is spend some time in prison. Obviously not the prison of today, because that may be a little different than a prison back then. Yeah. Yeah. I want to come back to probably, I mentioned before the, three, the two books that I had about change. We had to get one thing right about change. And this was the one that sort of puzzled me for a while. Because for change to work, we need a technical plan, strategy, what I teach. But you guys all know this, having strategy is not enough. You also need a social plan, how to get people excited about the strategy, about what it is you want to do. What we also struggled with is a lot of our conversation about leadership and teamwork, it's really culturally embedded. So again, if I said, pass the puck, you would know what that would mean in a team type of setting. If I said, great leaders move the chains, you would know what that would mean in a team type setting. Now I'm in Botswana. Those concepts didn't make sense. So now how do I communicate with analogies or with insights, the ideas I want to say, in a words that honor the complexity, but it's something they can do something with. We got lucky. We went on the game ride in Botswana, and we thought we'd go see lions. And the guy says, you don't want to see lions. I'm in Africa, I want to see lions. He says, no, lazy in politics. I thought that's the start of a good story. If I had another hour, I'd tell you that story. But yeah, I want to come to the end of the story. What they were most excited about, what we became excited about, a pack of wild dogs. First, they are more effective hunters than lions, more effective hunters than cheetahs. They're more successful. So once you get that out of the way, how? Because they're smaller, they're uglier, and they're not as strong as cheetahs, as leopards, or as lions. So how do they do it? It's an ugly kill. That's the best way I can describe it. It's an ugly kill. And so then we started using this analogy of creating a pack of wild dogs. We started using this analogy of what happens when you get a bunch of conscious people together trying to go make something happen. You get a pack of wild dogs. That's a great analogy. But before we get to a pack of wild dogs, I want to ask, are you a wild dog? Because I can't get a great result from a great team if I don't have great individuals. And for the basketball people in the room, my empirical proof of wild dogs other than the Los Angeles Lakers with Kobe Bryant. NBA championship teams are wild dogs. How do we measure wild dogs? On a different game, a different person is a leading scorer. When LeBron James lost in the finals, he led leading scorer every game. When LeBron James won in the finals with Miami, Dwayne Wade, Chris Bosh were leading scorer. Cleveland, Kyrie Irving, uh, what's his name, the shooter would lead in, Kevin Love would lead in scoring. So that's sort of the idea we're getting at there. Are you a wild dog? I, I could have put a lot of quotes up or a lot of insights up. I just find this one uh, to symbolize what I'm getting at in a way. I went to Martin Luther King. This is his last speech. And people talk about this speech because it was so prophetic, because he died the next day. Especially when you get to the part where it says, I like to live a long life. Uh, longevity has its place. He died the next day. Again, this was his last lecture. But I think you missed the point of the speech of where he's focusing in on. First off, when he says, and then I get into Memphis, and there were threats to talk about threats, he means actual threats. Uh, he left the plane from Atlanta to Memphis, but before the plane took off, they had to stop because there was a threat of a bomb on the plane because the folks in Memphis really did not want him in Memphis. And so then they get off, take the bags off, nope, no bomb, get back on, 
And the basic gist of his speech was, we're going to march for sanitation workers, white and black, in Memphis. They don't want us here. It's going to rain the next day. And then they're going to put us in jail. Who's with me? That was the speech. So when he says there were threats, he means actual threats. Beat up, prison, potential bomb. But then listen to the mental shift in his head. And then he says, but I'm not concerned about that now. I want to do God's will. I've seen the promised land. And he ends with this amazing shift. And I am happy tonight. That's always haunted me. He starts out by saying difficult days ahead, sort of as he's reflecting on what needs to happen. But he ends by saying he is happy tonight. So what's he happy about? What is he excited about? I think he's excited because he sees that he gets to do the thing he thinks he's here to do. He doesn't wish for race relationships to be bad. He's not waking up every day, I hope the whites and the blacks hate each other in the US. But there is tension. And he thinks he's been gifted with skills and abilities to do something about it, so he's happy he gets to do something about it. You can imagine uh, nurses. Hopefully no nurse wakes up every day. I hope the people are sick today. But people do get sick. So then shouldn't they be happy that with all their training, they get to make sick people well? I hope teachers don't wake up and say, I hope the kids are really in trouble and difficult today. But shouldn't they say, there are difficult kids out there. I've been trained to reach them. I'm happy I get a chance to go reach them. So we often hear, and I hear people say, I have to do this, I have to do this. In a weird way, I think, you get to do this. You get to do this. How cool is it that you get to actually show up in a country you didn't build and take classes in a university you didn't create and go get a job that you didn't invent? You get to go do that. I find that really inspiring on and of itself. And I say all of that because now you're going to throw stuff at me and get me off the stage. I apologize up front. Right? <laughs> Why? Because after all that inspiration, you got to go do work. You got to do work. In a sense, and again, I am going to embarrass my two kids. That's the picture of them when they were little. I knew, their mom knew early on, they were going to be short. You take the height, weight, chart thing. At two years old, how tall they're going to be, we know they'd be not seven foot tall. But then they said they wanted to play basketball. So what do we do as parents? Ah, sorry. That's not going to help us. It's not going to work. What do we do? Uh, you, then I realized they didn't ask me they can be basketball players. They said, I want to play basketball. So what's between them at seven and eight and them playing basketball? Work. That's it. Right. That's my story. Again, I grew up not with two aces in my pocket. I grew up with a two and a three off-suited. What was between me and them? Work. If I talk to my mom on the phone today, the best advice she ever gave me. My mom grew up in a tiny village in Alabama that's close to another small town, that's close to a town that eventually gets to Livingston, you may see it in the map, that eventually gets to Tuscaloosa, eventually Birmingham. She only went to school when she wasn't working on the farm. So she's proud of the fact that with that little of an education, she got a high school degree. All her kids, no surprise, as we turn teenagers, we want to become knuckleheads. And she said, basically, you're going to have to work really, really, really hard for about a decade. Why not do it when you're in your teens and 20s, then wait till her age when she was in her 40s and 50s? I've never thought about it. I've never forgot that. At the end of the day, you're going to have to work really hard. There is no mistake for that. But then you know that, though, in a sense. I mean, I see it all the time with students. And first, it starts with the undergrads. They get upset about the 8 a.m. class. To which I say, but didn't you register for the 8 a.m. class? <laughs> like, did you think you would register and they would magically make it 3 p.m.? <laughs> and then I teach MBAs who knew they had a job, knew they had a spouse and kids, and then they want to complain that they're in my class at 6 o'clock because they can't hang out with their wife and the spouse and kids. To which I say the same thing. 
didn't you know you had a spouse? <laughs> right? You begged, you applied to come to this school. Please, please pick me. I'm better than everybody else. I'm going to work really hard. And then you get here and I hear, this is hard work. <laughs> Whew, did they know this was hard work? I'm going to do nothing until someone else does this hard work. But trust me, in full disclosure, professors are exactly the same. You guys just don't see it. If you came on campus in August, we love August. <laughs> Grass is green. It finally looks pretty in Edmonton in August. I get to go to the Starbucks and take my time and order what I want. And then what happens? End of August. Students come back. <laughs> they start asking questions. So I'm going to be gone for a month. Will I miss anything? Uh, I have something to do on this day, and I know I'm scheduled for a presentation on that day. What do you want me to do? <laughs> and my favorite is they stand in line at 10 o'clock at the Starbucks by the library, not knowing what they want. Uh, what do you want? Uh, get out of the line. <laughs> and if you listen closely, you'll hear professors say, this would be an amazing job if it wasn't for the students. <laughs> so we all say it. I think we just forget that it requires work. Of the poems that probably have touched me the most, it's the poem by William Ernest Henley. It's Invictus. Out of the night that covers me, black as the pit from pole to pole, I thank whatever God there may be for my uncomfortable soul. In the failed clutches of circumstance, I've not winced nor cried aloud. Under blood and of chance, my head is bloody but unbowed. And I forget the part in the middle. And then he says, it matters not how straight the gate, how charged the punishment to scroll. I'm the master of my fate. I'm the captain of my soul. I know when I grew up on most college campuses, you would see the last line. I am the master of my fate. I'm the captain of my soul. That's a great narrative. You can do whatever you want. The part that puzzled me was it matters not how straight the gate, how charged the punishment to scroll. So I started doing a little digging on William Ernest Henley. He was an average poet born in the 1849 or something like that. As a kid at 12 years old, he had TB, lost a leg. Now he's in his 30s, and the doctor thinks the disease is coming back, and they may have to take his second leg. They say, we got a couple of options. They actually brought in Lister, the Listerine guy, they actually brought him in because he was a doctor to come and figure out what can we do to not lose his leg. On his hospital bed, knowing that he's getting ready to do some crazy surgery, that if it doesn't work, we'll lose both his legs, he wrote the poem. It's easy to think I'm the master of my fate, I'm the captain of my soul, when I have two aces. When things are going great, when things are awesome, when I am at the top of my game. He's saying, even if you're getting ready to lose your second leg, you're the master of your fate. You're the captain of your soul. That's why he makes the point about it matters not how straight the gate. Doesn't matter how charged the punishment to scroll. Whether the class is at 8 a.m. or 2 p.m. Whether if you're working, you have great workers or you have terrible workers. When I would go over to Botswana, they would ask the same thing all the time. How are we doing? I would say, I don't know. It's not like I've ever been involved in a country trying to change before. So it looks like you guys are doing okay. And then we started joking, because you're not Zimbabwe. <laughs> because you're not the Congo. And so in some sense, it's easy to compare to, we don't have what the US has. We don't have what Canada has. That's the wrong comparison. The comparison is, we get to live another day. How cool is that? We get to keep going. How cool is that? And so in a sense, the part of that quote for me I like the most is, it matters not how straight the gate. I charge the punishment to scroll. So at the end of all of that, I think the part that I find most disappointing is we work hard, we bust our butt, we get clear on what we want, and then we're too tired to celebrate. So there's no surprise, we just spiral down and spiral down and spiral down. Truth be told, one of my guilty pleasures, I like to show the Property Brothers. So if you've never seen the Property Brothers, basically it's these two brothers, the Property Brothers, and somebody says they want this fancy house. But the fancy house costs about a million bucks. 
but they don't have a million bucks. So they say, we can buy this house for $500,000 and we can remodel it with maybe $100,000 so you get this million dollar house. That's the basic idea of the house. The part that always catches me is when the couple wants the house, they always want this massive kitchen. And they want this massive kitchen, why? So they can throw a big party, have all their friends over. When I see that show, guess what I think? That's just a lot to clean. <laughs> That's just a lot of mess. That's just a lot of, because you can imagine those same couples, if I went back a year ago, what would they be arguing over? The messy kitchen, how it's hard to clean because they probably didn't throw the actual party. They probably never had the celebration of the kitchen. So in some sense, we buy the house, we never throw the party. Because if you don't throw the party, what's left? Taking out trash. That has to happen. But that's no different at work. If we never celebrate, what's left? Difficult employees. That's no different than school. If we never celebrate our grades, what's left? Test and studying. So in some sense, I would build in when you celebrate. Think about the two bottom pictures. We know why Usain Bolt celebrated. He went gold, gold, gold. He's won all these golds, everything else. Why is the Canadian guy celebrating? He came in third, second, and like one of his thirds, he only got because the Americans disqualified. <laughs> so why is he celebrating? Because it's hard work being the third fastest in the world. That's really hard work. Yeah. And so in a sense, you know, as I thought about what I would say, I really wanted to sort of sum up in some sense that you got to get clear on you. You got to figure out you. It's a full-time job. As you start getting clear on that, you got to start thinking, what is it I really want? Because when you get clear what it is you want, you'll find it. To do that, I think you got to spend a lot of time in prison. Spend some time thinking. To do that, you'll start surrounding yourself with others that are what? In prison with you, thinking the same thing. Once you do that, you'll work. And once you work, you'll celebrate. Those are my last words. Thanks a lot. This is on. Great. Um, I just wanted to open up the floor. Well, first I wanted to thank you. That was wonderful. That was inspiring. And um, I'm sure people have some questions or comments they'd like to share. Uh, so if anybody wants to come up and use the mic, you're welcome to, or you can just shout it out if you're a loud talker. Does anybody have any questions for Dr. Washington? All righty. See somebody. I'm hoping you're a loud talker. <laughs> How is the prison theory of leadership presented in today's world? The prison theory of leadership, mm -hmm. how is it presented in today's world? Oh, I think it's time to think. So there's a great book, uh, Good to Great. If you know the book, Good to Great is a couple of years old. And basically the idea, give me two sentences backwards first, uh, built to last, why are some companies better than other companies? He thought leadership would matter. He found out that leadership wasn't that central. So if you actually read the beginning of the book, he says, what surprised me? Leadership wasn't that central. But here was the challenge. His methodology of the companies that were built to last was a little bit flawed. He took companies that may have already been great at the beginning of the study and compared them to companies that were not great at the beginning of the study. That's like me and a short person saying who will be taller tomorrow. <laughs> the real study would be to take two kids of the same height and track their height over time. When he did that, leadership mattered amazingly. It came out really important. That's where you get the idea of level five leader, if you know the book. What's important is many of the level five leaders had a jail-like experience. It may not have been in prison, maybe a family heart attack, maybe a death in the family. The one that catches me, again, this is a side example. Think about Queen Elizabeth. Every year we celebrate her year of being the queen. What does she celebrate? The year her dad died. So she found out somebody died, now you're the queen. What do you think she's thinking? Am I gonna die as the queen too? If that's the case, 
how does it shape what I do? If that's the case, is this something I want to go do? That to me, when I say jail, I mean it that way. I mean, you're finding time to really reflect. People often ask me, what do I do to become a great leader? Same answer. I really got it from Magic Johnson about becoming a great basketball player. He said, diversity of experiences, try a lot of different things, and reflection. Sit down and think about it. What did I like? What did I not like? What worked well? What didn't work well? I think many of us will get to the diversity of experiences. Very few of us get to the thinking part, the reflection part. Hopefully that helps. Yeah. Any other questions? That's not a question, just a comment. I spent 20 days in Africa over the holidays, mm -hmm. and I came back a different person. Excellent. Yes. Spent a long time there. Yes. Yes. Excellent. You got it. Yeah. And truth be told, I mean, I, unfortunately, if I had, you know, more space and time, I would give you equally four amazing stories about my time in Botswana. Right. So Botswana, part of what attracted me to Botswana, it was so counter the narrative. So just sort of very stereotype. There was no ethnic wars going on in Botswana. There wasn't overt, you know, visible signs of poverty in, in Botswana. So in that sense, that's what surprised me. That's what excited me. My joke with people was, you're in Botswana. No, I'm in Grand Prairie. Because that's what it looked like. Right? If you've been to Grand Prairie, there are no igloos outside of Grand Prairie. There are no polar bears coming through the town. <laughs> but if you don't know that, you would think that about Grand Prairie because it's so far north. Botswana was very similar to me. It was so counter the image in my head, that was part of my allure of going back. And then once I dug deeper, then I saw all of this stuff that just shaped me in a very profound way. I would, if I had a commercial, go to Botswana. Um, any other questions or comments? I see one over here. Do you keep in touch with Botswana? And if not, why not? Oh, definitely. Yes. Uh, it's, it's, I'm laughing up front because this is going to sound way overly pretentious. And I don't mean it too up front, right? But 12 years in the country with people, people who started out as mid-level managers now run the country. And that's just, again, I'm not at all saying I had anything to do with that. That's just an answer to that question. It's like, so I see them because their names are in the paper. You know, uh, one of my coolest stories or contacts was uh, most folks in Botswana have an, an English name, although their you know, born name is something else, right? So uh, Dr. Tambale, he was an uh, engineer in charge of water affairs. And we're in a session with him. And I'm doing this thing about what are you looking for? What are you looking for? What are you looking for? And he has this sort of, you know, he wants to say something but doesn't say it. I finally said, they called him Russia. So I finally said, Russia, what are you trying to say? He says, I want to be PS one day, permanent secretary. Basically, like saying I want to be deputy minister in Alberta's context, right? And there was a hush in the room because you didn't say you wanted to be PS in the country. You became PS. I think, thank God you said it. Now you know what to go look for. Six years later, he became PS. Three years later from that, there was a drought in Botswana. He was the guy that was in charge of the drought. And so we would keep up and connect in that sense, right? So it's really honoring for me to see that when I was there in 99, these are people that were low level. As I was, my last time over was about 2013 probably. They were truly running the country. So I grew up with them in some sense. Yeah. Yeah. Facebook makes it easy now. Yeah. <laughs> Can you speak to just some qualities that you look for and identify wild dogs in the organization? Like how, do, how would you look at it? Yeah. It's easier when it's a basketball. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's a little bit more difficult. Yeah, that's a great question, right? And so, uh, the t so, again, the academic in me, we started with this cute analogy, and then we spent forever reading everything about actual wild dogs because we didn't want to actually go beyond what they actually can do. And then we started testing this. And so I would have to give credit to Texas Tech University because I taught uh, strategic management in a big lecture lab. So I have 400 students that I would lecture with, and they would go to labs in groups of 50. The groups of 50 would do a simulation. And so we would test wild dog traits, and if they predict the simulation results, the traits that matter, shared leadership. It isn't about me being in charge, it's about the work getting done. Shared vision. Do we actually all want the same things? Uh, tenacity, how long do hunts last until we solve the problem? And then individual skills. 
So I have to be able to do the work. I just may not do the work. A really good friend of mine, to sort of connect this up, a really good friend of mine named Keith Mernion, he probably did the coolest research I ever saw. Wanted to spend time in London, basically. Needed a grant to do research in London. Started studying string quartets. And he found that one of the things that makes some string quartets better in terms of sell more records, in terms of more money at concerts, the strength of the second fiddle. So the second fiddle has to be as good as the lead person, but not want to be a lead person. Because if I'm not that good, I can't push the group. But if I'm so good that I want it, I'm fighting in the group. I think those would be similar to wild dog traits. Maybe we could take this one last question and then we can all join Dr. Washington in the lobby for a reception. So uh, your first story about uh, the doctors and uh, uh, the accountants mm. fighting with each other. Yeah. And uh, I think uh, we can face similar situations like two different groups and then you are the one to comment on it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How do you attack such uh, situations like this? When there are, like, you have to either say go in this way or yeah. like, yeah. what would be the right way of that that's a great question, right? I'll first tell you what I did, whether that was right or wrong, and I'd sort of say, you know, what I would have done differently probably, right? I think what I did was I tried to go to a different question and take it off of the arm wrestle. I'm right, you're right, I'm right, you're right, because that becomes winners and losers, right? And no one likes that when if we don't spend the money, then the doctors lose. If we spend the money, then the accountants lose. So I kept trying to look for a mutual base. I think what I would have done is I probably would have spent more time and had them talk out loud more to talk themselves through it. Because I think both groups would have gotten that they were in sort of extreme positions that we shouldn't be talking about. We should be talking about the average position. But it was so easy to get locked into the extreme position. All lives are important. We should never let anybody go, ever, ever. We should keep trying to save them to the last second. Extreme position. We shouldn't spend any money on someone after they get to a certain stage with the disease. Those are extreme. In reality, neither one of them wanted that. But once they had a conflict, arm wrestle, they pushed back to those issues. I probably would have said, let's hold those aside. What's the average issue? What's the average concern? To actually get us some traction on it. And that's probably what I would have done differently. Yeah. Thank you.